Lesson 4. Basic Electronics. Contents. The topics covered in this lesson are breadboarding circuits. What is electricity? Voltage, current, resistance. Ohm's law, circuit basics. Electronic components. Analog and digital signals. Digital electronics, logic gates. The breadboard. The name, breadboard, comes from the fact that decades ago, the boards typically used for cutting bread were used for making electronic circuits. Using a solderless breadboard is time-saving, flexible, and beginner-friendly unlike solderable breadboards or printed circuit boards that require soldering and take longer time. Typically these are used at a later stage of prototyping once the circuit design is verified. Breadboards come in various sizes, the most common sizes being full, half and mini. The mini breadboards are often found on shields that go on top of microcontrollers or education boards, that have other peripherals as well. The choice between these sizes is based on the application, complexity of the circuit, number of components that go on the board, etc. As an electronic student and or enthusiast, perhaps one of the most important items in your toolbox is the breadboard. It's used in all of our stamps and class text, including what's a microcontroller and robotics with the Bobot, as a place to wire our circuits. But have you ever given any thought to the inner workings of this little white board or how it came to be? Well, whether you have or you haven't, we're going to go through the history of the breadboard as well as its uses today. Now, the term breadboard is actually quite literal. The first breadboards were really blocks of wood that were used for cutting bread. And early electronic components such as transformers and tube sockets were mounted to them. Now, these components were then connected using a technique called point-to-point -point construction, in which the wires of these electronic components were soldered to copper strips that were either nailed or screwed to the underside of the board. Now, you may ask yourself, why breadboards? And the answer is simple. It was the early 1900s and breadboards were cheap, easy to obtain, and sturdy enough to support the monstrous early electronic components. Today, breadboards are made of plastic and they're mainly used for experimentation. They provide a great way to prototype your project before moving it to a final PCB design. Or, like in our Stamps in Class series, they provide a blank canvas for you to construct, unconstruct, and reconstruct all types of fun electronic projects and inventions. Now, breadboards also come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and the type that you use for your project will completely depend on your preferences. Here we have the breadboard that's used on both the homework board and the Board of Education. Normally, there's an adhesive backing which can be used for mounting the breadboard onto a platform for your project and also protects the back of the board from touching undesired conductive material. If you remove the adhesive backing, however, you'll see a bunch of metal rows, which are really metal clips. If you poke one out, you can see what it looks like. Each of these clips correspond to one of these holes, giving your circuit a secure connection. So each time you're plugging a wire into a hole on the breadboard, you're really plugging it into one of these clips. Since each clip is connected through a single piece of metal, each hole in these horizontal rows are connected. However, take a look at this break down the middle. Since the metal strip is no longer connected, the holes on this side of the board won't be connected to those on this side. It's important to mention that a horizontal connection is not always the case. For example, let's take a look at these interlocking breadboards. These skinny pieces are generally used for providing power and ground connections to your circuit. Note the red and black lines. These rows are connected vertically, with the black or ground connection running down one side, and the red or power connection running down the other. You may notice that there is a break in the power strip while the ground strip is connected all the way down. This is designed so that you can supply two different voltages to your circuit, which comes in handy when you have sensors that require 5 volts of power, communicating with a microcontroller that might only be rated for 3.3 volts. Say, however, you want to apply one voltage to this entire power strip. All you have to do is connect the two separated sockets with a wire. Now an electrical connection is present across this bridge, 
which means that any voltage applied to any of these sockets will supply that same voltage to this entire row. As with anything in math or science, a little bit of proof goes a long way. So let's take a look at a couple of example breadboard setups using some LEDs, resistors, and a power supply. An LED will be easy to see if there is an electrical connection present, since the LED will glow if power is applied to it. So here's our connection. We have a battery connected to the far left rows, supplying 9 volts of power. A current limiting resistor is connected to the positive lead of the LED, and the negative lead is connected to ground. Once we connect power, the light comes on. Now remember that each socket in a horizontal row is electrically connected. So what do you think would happen if we added a second LED in the same horizontal rows as the first one? If you guessed that the second LED would come on, you would be correct. Now what if we change the setup so it looks like this? Is that the same? Yes. Remember that rows across this bridge are not electrically connected, so it's the same as connecting the LED in the same vertical row. Now here's one last quiz, just to make sure that you all are playing along at home. Here was our original circuit. If we change it to this, will it be electrically connected? Nope. Even though these are all in the same horizontal row, remember that the connection breaks down the middle. And that's the basics of breadboarding. Now get out there and start prototyping. How a breadboard works. This slide gives an overview of how a breadboard works. On the surface, a breadboard has holes in a grid pattern to insert leads of electronic components like resistors. LEDs, etc. However, on the inside, there are metal strips that serve as conductors for specific rows. Breadboard connections. The figure shows how the breadboard holes are interconnected. The power rails, plus and minus, from 1 to 30, are connected horizontally, even across the gaps between set of five holes. On the other hand, A to E and F to J are separated by a center divider. However, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D and 1E, shown in yellow, are connected by a single metal strip, and so are 1F, 1G, 1H, 1I, and 1J. Similarly, 2A to 2E, shown in green, are connected, 2F to 2J, shown in dark blue, are connected, and so on. The image on the right shows the inside of a breadboard, which gives a clearer view of the breadboard connections under its surface. If possible, it is advisable to use a transparent breadboard, shown on the left, that somewhat makes the metal strips visible and helps avoid confusion. But it does not take much time to get used to using a breadboard following the guidelines in the next slides and some practice. Breadboard. Guidelines and tips. Making circuits on a breadboard is convenient but can get messy as the complexity of the circuit increases and consequently, so do the number of components. Using shorter jumper wires whenever possible, as few wires as possible, and making connections to resemble the circuit schematic can help avoid mistakes, keep the circuit clean, and makes the troubleshooting process easier. Integrated circuits, IC, is a set of electronic circuits on a small flat chip that makes it convenient to make electronic circuits. Usually amplifiers, microcontrollers, etc., come in this form factor. These ICs are ideally supposed to be placed such that the pins on the IC are on either sides of the center divider, on the breadboard. One may not always have the right size of wires needed and resistors often come with leads larger than required. Although it seems like an additional task, it is worthwhile to cut component leads to manageable lengths to avoid accidental short circuits that can occur due to different component leads coming in contact outside the breadboard. Last but not the least. Work from a schematic and check off each connection one by one and check the circuit for errors. It is always useful to have a second pair of eyes for verification, before connecting the power supply to the breadboard. Power Supply Module 
The Elegu Arduino Starter Kit comes with a power supply module. For all the activities in this lesson, the power supply module can be used instead of directly powering the breadboard using the battery. Activity 1. Construct the circuit shown using guidelines for proper breadboarding. The color code on a resistor can help determine the value of its resistance. Later in this lesson, calculating the resistance from the color code will be explained. For this activity, the objective is to just get familiar with making circuits on a breadboard. So just use the resistor with the color code shown in the circuit schematic above. Pause the video here to do this activity and hit play when you are done. Activity 1. Solution. The picture on the left shows the actual circuit and on the right is the circuit schematic for reference. Activity 2. Determine the error in this circuit. Pause the video here to do this activity and hit play when you are done. Activity 2. Solution. As you can see the two resistor are not connected on the breadboard since there is connection between parallel rows inside the breadboard. Observe and compare the circuit diagram and the schematic carefully to understand the error clearly. What is electricity? We know that everything is made of atoms and an atom consists of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Electrons can jump outside their atoms when pushed by some force called as voltage or potential difference, causing them to flow in a material. Conductors and insulators. Not all materials allow flow of electrons in the same way. Materials in which charge carriers, usually electrons, can move easily from one atom to another when voltage is applied, are called conductors. The materials in which electrons cannot flow freely, atoms have tightly bound electrons, are called insulators. Electric current. Flow of such a high number of electrons, 1.602 x1019, per second are required to cause 1 amp of current. Conventionally people used to think protons which flows opposite to electrons caused current but later realized it was electrons. But since it was globally adapted, we don't change that and show current direction to be from positive end of battery, electron accepting end, to negative end of battery, electron emitting end. Current direction. Conventional. In the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin considered electricity analogous to an invisible fluid in his experiment. It was assumed that the glass rod had excess of this invisible fluid, and that the transfer of this fluid to the object in contact, here, human hand, was what is now known as static electricity. Therefore, it was wrongly assumed that current flows from positive, glass rod, to negative side, human hand, analogous to how water flows from high level to low level. Current direction, electron flow. In reality, the silk cloth removes the electrons from the glass rod and human hand provides electrons to the glass rod. Therefore, it is in fact the electrons flow from the person to the glass tube. That is, the human hand is negatively charged and the glass rod is positive. Opposite of what was assumed by Benjamin Franklin. But this negatively charged subatomic particle, electron, was only proven to exist by Joseph Thomson in 1897. Therefore, presumably, as a tribute to Benjamin Franklin and to avoid the confusion of batteries that were already manufactured, the conventional current direction is followed, even today. Moreover, as for the formulas used in any electrical domain, they work regardless of the direction assumed. Current direction. Conclusion. It is good to know that the scientifically correct direction of current is from negative terminal to the positive terminal since that is how the electrons flow in a circuit. However, most textbooks and electrical derivations, the conventional current direction is assumed. Batteries. The source of the force, that is, voltage, required for flow of electrons can be produced by various means. Chemical reaction being one of them. A battery stores chemical energy and converts it to electrical energy. The chemical reactions inside a battery involve the flow of electrons from one electrode to another through an external circuit, which is electric current. Batteries are the source of potential difference and measured in SI units of volts. Voltage and current. Water analogy for voltage and current. Voltage is analogous to pressure and current is analogous to flow of water. 
How do we increase the force causing current or increase current without increasing force? Why do you think we need higher force and higher currents? Because not all materials offer the same resistance, conductance, etc. Moreover, different components have different voltage and current requirements to operate. To be more specific, the electric circuit and water circuit comparison shown can help understand the analogy. The battery is a source of voltage analogous to how a pump increases the energy of water to move it upwards. The flow of electronics is analogous to the flow of water, and lastly, the flow of electrons cause the bulb to glow analogous to how the work done by water moves the turbine. The resistor restricts the flow of electrons, which is analogous to the upper storage tank shown, which reduces the flow of water. The turbine also reduces flow of water as the work is done to move it. Similarly, even the bulb has some resistance. Series versus parallel circuits. Resistors in series have the same current, coulombs per second. The flow of water, gallons per minute, through pipe constrictions in series is the same, assuming there are no leaks or air bubbles in the pipes. Resistors in parallel have the same voltage. Pipe constructions in parallel have the same pressure difference. Resistance. Ohm's law gives an empirical relation between the voltage, current and resistance in an electrical circuit. It states that the voltage across a conductor is directly proportional to the current flowing through it, provided all physical conditions and temperatures remain constant. Resistors. Again, considering the water analogy, resistance in an electric circuit restricts the flow of electrons, which is analogous to a kink in a pipe that restricts the flow of water. Resistors used in circuits are devices that offer a specified amount of resistance and are used to control current in an electronic circuit. Resistor color coding. Resistors are color coded by various bands to indicate the resistance value. The number of bands are usually 4 or 5. The resistance value is calculated as shown. For a 4 band resistor, the numbers representing the first two color bands are the two digits in the resistance value, which is multiplied by the value represented by the third band, the multiplier. The last band is just the tolerance to indicate the error that can be due to temperature. More precise resistor have tighter tolerance. Multimeter. For the next activity you will require to use a multimeter to measure the resistance value of some resistors. This video gives a quick introduction on how to use a multimeter safely. Hey, how's it going, do this all first? Today we're going to be going back to the basics and I'm going to be showing you how to properly use a multimeter. And we'll be covering how to measure DC voltage, AC voltage, resistance and continuity, and also how to measure amps. All right, let's start with DC voltage. Uh, basically, the main source of DC voltage in the different devices that we use these days are going to be batteries. Or in other words, anything that uses batteries runs on DC voltage. For example, anything on your car that runs off the car battery, your wireless DeWalt drill, or any camera or camcorder that runs off a battery, they all run off of DC voltage. And if you're wondering, DC stands for direct current. And when you're using the multimeter to measure for DC voltage, you need to set your dial to this setting where you get a V for voltage and the straight and dotted line for direct voltage. And next, you need to make sure your test leads are in the right location. Now your ground or common test lead is always gonna go right here where it says COM. But the red test lead is the one you're gonna be switching around based on what you're measuring. And for measuring voltage, you need to place your red test lead here where you see the sign, which is V for voltage. Now as far as where you exactly wanna set this dial when you're measuring voltage, you basically wanna set this to the next number up from the maximum amount of voltage you're gonna be measuring. So for example, if we're gonna be measuring the voltage on this uh, 1.5 volt AA battery, we're gonna set our dial to two volts on the DC voltage scale. Next, we put our positive test lead on the power or positive side of our circuit, and then the ground test lead on the negative or ground side. And as you can see, we got 1.6 volts, which means this is a fully charged battery. And if you're ever unsure about the amount of voltage you're measuring, you can always start off higher, like we got here on 200, and then come lower to get a more precise reading. Now, if you're ever unsure and hook up your test leads the wrong way, you're gonna see this negative sign next to your voltage reading like we got here. Now, this doesn't hurt the multimeter, and it's actually a pretty decent way of finding your positive and negative side of your circuit. Next up, measuring AC voltage. And basically, any device that plugs into your ball socket uses AC voltage. And AC stands for alternating current. And when measuring for AC voltage, your black test lead stays in the same place, obviously, and your red test lead stays in the same place, since, again, we're measuring voltage. 
but you need to switch your dial from DC voltage to the AC voltage area, and you know that by this wave sign that next to the V here. So next we're gonna see whether we have current at a wall socket or not. And since we get about 110 volts here in the States, uh, we're gonna set our dial to 200, which is the next one up from the voltage we're expecting to measure. All right, a word of caution. When measuring high voltage like this, you need to be 100% sure of the integrity of your multimeter, plus the wires that go to your test leads and the test leads themselves. Also, when you go to take your measurement, make sure your fingers are away from the tip of the test leads, but also when you get near the socket that your test leads don't come into contact or near each other. So next we grab our ground test lead and we're gonna put this in the bigger slot on our wall socket. And then we grab our red test lead and we're gonna put it on this other side, which is the power side. And as you can see, we got 118 volts coming out of this, which is about right. Also, if you ever wondered what this one is for, this is your case ground. And a good way to check it is to see whether you get a reading when you do this, and we do, so this is good as well. All right, next up, measuring resistance. And resistance is basically the amount of opposition that any substance has to the flow of electric current. So for example, this piece of wood is extremely resistant to the flow of current, whereas this wire has next to no resistance to the flow of electric current. Now, different components of an electric circuit are supposed to have a certain amount of resistance so that the whole system works properly. And uh, that's where knowing how to exactly measure resistance is very crucial. Now, when measuring for resistance, your black test lead stays in the same place. And on this multimeter, the red test lead also stays in the same place because this uh, horseshoe looking thing is a sign for resistance. And we put our dial here where we get the scale for resistance. And for this example, I'm gonna be measuring the resistance for this spark plug wire. And this spark plug wire is supposed to have a resistance of about 10,000 ohms. Ohms being the unit of measurement for resistance. All right, same as before, since we expect a measurement of 10,000, we're gonna set our dial to the next number up, which is 20K, or in other words, 20,000 ohms. All right, here we go. And as you can see, we got 9.88, 9.89 thousand ohms of resistance, or in other words, 9,860 or 870 ohms of resistance for this spark plug wire, which is about spec. All right, next, let's go on to testing for continuity. And testing for continuity basically means checking an electric circuit to see whether current can flow through it. And when testing with a multimeter, your multimeter sends a tiny amount of voltage through that circuit, and then continuity is verified, usually by an alarm or a beep. So for continuity, we set our dial here to this icon that sort of looks like a sound wave. And since we're still in the resistance setting, our test leads stay in the same area. So for example, if you wanted to make sure the wires that go to this connector are in good shape and that electricity or current can travel through them, you would attach one of your test leads to one end and then your other test leads to the corresponding pin on the connector. And if you hear that beep, that means you got continuity. And if you do this and you don't hear a beep, it means that you got a short somewhere in this, uh, in this wire, or in other words, in our case, maybe a cut or a burnt wire. Now I did this test on a rather small scale, but this can be done on a much larger scale, or in other words, larger circuits, or even smaller circuits than this, like a motherboard of your computer. A word of caution though, whenever you test for resistance or continuity, you have to make sure that the device is not powered. So either unplug it or remove the batteries. Next up, how to measure amps. Now when you measure amps on this multimeter, you need to switch your test lead from this slot to one of these. Now on this multimeter, this first one is fused, which means if you measure more than 200 milliamps, you're gonna blow a fuse inside your multimeter, but your multimeter as a whole is gonna be saved. But this second one is unfused on this multimeter, which means if you measure more than 20 amps, you're gonna ruin your multimeter. Also, if you're unsure about the amount of amps you'll be measuring, but you know if it's uh, less than 20 amps, you can always start with this higher one and then move down for a more precise reading. So for this example, we're gonna measure and see how many amps this little light bulb uses. So we put our red test lead in this setting. And next we're gonna set our dial and since this light bulb is battery powered, we're gonna set it to 20 amps on the DC voltage setting. And the way you measure amps is basically you place your multimeter on the power side of the circuit you're measuring. So here's the wire from the positive side of this battery. You place your red test lead closer to the power source, and then from there power comes, travels through your multimeter, through the black test lead, to the positive side of your device. And next when we complete the circuit by connecting our ground side, our light bulb turns on and we get our reading, and we, as you can see we got 1.95 amps. 
So it was a great move putting our red test lead on this higher setting to measure 20 amps, otherwise we would have blown a fuse here. And those are the basic functions of a multimeter. Hope that cleared things up. And if you find anything useful in this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also consider checking out some of my other videos where I use this multimeter to diagnose problems with uh, my cars. I'll put them up on the screen as video links so you can just click on it. All right, thanks for watching. See you next time. Activity 3. Use the table for reference to calculate the resistor value based on color coding in the next slide. Activity 3. Find the resistors from the Elegoo kit using the color codes shown in the slide. Calculate the values using the reference table in the previous slide, and verify the values with multimeter readings. Pause the video here to do this activity and hit play when you are done. Activity 3. Solution. These are the actual values of the resistor shown in activity 3. Pause to check your answers and proceed when done. Resistors in series. When resistors are connected in series, the total resistance offered adds up. The total voltage supplied to the series circuit is equal to the sum of the individual voltage drops. Hence total current required will be higher. But the current on the other hand is the same in each resistor. Since the current flowing out of one resistor flows into the input of the second resistor, there is no other path with lesser resistance for the current to flow. As you can see the total resistance offered by the series circuit is just the sum of individual resistors, that is, the total resistance of the circuit increases. The current flowing through all the three resistors is the same, 0.32 amps, but the voltage drop across each resistor is different. For example, the voltage drop across the 15 ohm resistor is 0.32 times 15 equals 4.8 volts. Resistors in parallel. The way in which the resistance, voltage and current change when resistors are connected in parallel is opposed to that of a series circuit. When resistors are connected in parallel, the total resistance offered decreases. The current is divided across each of the resistors while the voltage across each resistor remains the same. Analogy here is that between two endpoints you will always take same time to travel if you have enough energy. As you can see the smallest resistor, path of least resistance, has the most current passing through it. If Ohm's law is applied to the 4 ohm resistor, assuming 10 volts voltage supply, the current across it will be 10 volts divided by 6 ohms, which equals 1.67 amps. On the other hand, for the largest resistor, 12 ohms, the current flowing through it will be 10 volts divided by 12 ohms, which equals 0.83 amps. Activity 4. Determine the connection type and calculate total resistance for each figure. Refer previous slide for the formulae. Pause the video here to do this activity and hit play when you are done. Activity 4. Solution. Figure 1 has 2 kilo ohms and 1 kilo ohms connected in series. The total resistance of the series connection is the sum of the two, that is, 3 kilo ohms. Activity 4. Solution. Figure 2 has two 10 kilo ohms connected in parallel. The total resistance of the parallel connection is reduced to 5 kilo ohms, calculation shown in the slide. This total parallel connection is in series with another 10 kilo ohm resistor making the total resistance to be 5 kilo ohms plus 10 kilo ohms equals 15 kilo ohms. Resistor. A resistor is a passive component that limits the electrical current flowing in a circuit. Choosing a resistor. Since the use of a resistor is to limit the current to the components in a circuit, and the value of the resistor to be used should be calculated based on the rating of the component being used. For example, the supply voltage and current rating can be found in the datasheet of an LED or any component being used. Variable resistor. The resistance in a circuit can be changed in real time manually using a variable resistors. It consists of a resistance track with connections at both ends and a wiper which moves along the track as you turn the spindle. Light dependent resistor. LDR. Using a light dependent resistor, the resistance in a circuit can be changed in real time 
in proportion to the light in the surroundings. It is a type of sensor, the resistance of which decreases as the brightness of light falling on it increases. Diode. A diode is used in applications where current should only flow in one direction. It acts as a complete conductor in one direction, diode's forward direction, and complete insulator in the other, diode's reverse direction. For reference, all diodes have a gray band on one end, as it can be seen in the image, indicating its forward direction. Light emitting diode. LED. A light emitting diode is a special type of diode which emits light when conducting current in one direction, that is, its forward direction. LED has two leads. The longer lead is positive, and the shorter lead is negative. The polarity is also indicated by a flat end, which is negative, on one side of the base of LED's case. If the LED is connected in the opposite way, there will not be any current flow, and consequently, no light. But connecting it in the wrong way does not damage it. Diodes and LEDs. The concept of a pure insulator and pure conductor is not completely correct. Analogous to how if you force someone to do something by force and the person would have to agree, all insulators and conductors have their limits. It would cause harm when these limits are exceeded. Thus, there needs to be protection circuit to avoid it. One such example is that LEDs are always supposed to be connected in a circuit along with resistor. Diodes and LEDs. The concept of a pure insulator and pure conductor is not completely correct. Analogous to how if you force someone to do something by force and the person would have to agree, all insulators and conductors have their limits. It would cause harm when these limits are exceeded. Thus, there needs to be a protection circuit to avoid it. One such example is that LEDs are always supposed to be connected in a circuit along with a resistor. Activity 5. Construct a circuit and check if brightness of LED changes with variable resistor of 10 kilo ohms. Use the schematic diagram for reference. Pause the video here to do this activity and hit play when you are done. Activity 5. Solution. This is a demonstration video of the circuit built to control the brightness of an LED using a variable resistor of 10 kilo ohms. Transistors. The transistor is like an electronic switch. It can turn a current on and off. A simple way you can think of it is to look at the transistor as a relay without any moving parts. A transistor is similar to a relay in the sense that you can use it to turn something on and off. A bipolar junction transistor, BJT, is a common type of transistor that has three pins, base, B, collector, C, and emitter, E. There are two types of BJTs. NPN and PNP, the details of which are beyond the scope of this lesson, but they differ in construction, working and applications. In most cases NPN transistors are preferred over PNP transistors. How transistors work. Considering another water analogy, a current flowing from the base to the emitter, opens the flow of current from the collector to the emitter, analogous to how a small water flow can be used to control the larger water flow in a bigger pipe, shown in the slide. In a standard NPN transistor, you need to apply a voltage of about 0.7 volts between the base and the emitter to get the current flowing from base to emitter. When you apply 0.7 volts from base to emitter you will turn the transistor on and allow a current to flow from collector to emitter. In the example above you can see how transistors work. A 9 volts battery connects to an LED and a resistor. But it connects through the transistor. This means that no current will flow in that part of the circuit until the transistor turns on. To turn the transistor on you need to apply 0.7 volts from base to emitter of the transistor. Imagine you have a small 0.7 volts battery. In a practical circuit you would use resistors to get the correct voltage from whatever voltage source you have. When you apply the 0.7 volts battery from base to emitter, the transistor turns on. This allows current to flow from the collector to the emitter, and thereby turning the LED on. Capacitor. A capacitor is a passive electronic component that stores energy in the form of an electrostatic field. Capacitors could be considered as very small rechargeable batteries. 
The difference being they can act as a battery for very short interval of time depending on their specifications. More the capacitance, the more the current and less voltage it can carry. The capacitance is directly proportional to the surface areas of the plates and is inversely proportional to the separation between the plates. Capacitance also depends on the dielectric constant of the substance separating the plates. Speaker. A speaker is a device that is familiar to most people. It is an electroacoustic transducer that converts electrical input into sound. The cone moves in accordance with the variations of an electrical signal and causes sound waves to propagate through a medium such as air or water. Mechanical switches. A mechanical switch is a component that has terminals which get connected when the rocker is moved. In an electrical circuit, a switch is used for interrupting the current or diverting it from one conductor to another. There are various types. Single pole single throw. SPST. Double pole single throw. DPST. Double pole single throw. DPST. Etc. As shown in the diagram. Activity 6. Construct circuit such that switch can turn on and off LED. Pause the video here to do this activity and hit play when you are done. Activity 6. Solution. The Elegu kit has mechanical switches, that can be used to turn an LED on, off. This is a demonstration video to turn an LED on or off using a mechanical switch. Motor. A motor is an electromechanical device mostly based magnets rotating in response to current. Motors have two terminals that connect to a battery. The direction of rotation of the motor depends on the way the battery wires are connected to the terminals. Motors will be discussed in more detail in Lesson 5. What digital electronics do you use? Some digital electronic devices that are popular for usage in everyday life are computers, CD and DVD players, iPods, cell phones, digital cameras, food scales, etc. What is digital electronics? Digital signal means those signals with discrete, finite, number of levels, unlike analog signal that are continuous. Most signals in real life are not digital. For example, sound is an analog signal on a CD. Digital sound is encoded as 44.1 kHz, 16-bit audio. The original wave is, sliced, 44,100 times a second and an average amplitude level is applied to each sample. 16-bit means that a total of 65,536 different values can be assigned or quantized to each sample. DVD audio can be 96 or 192 kilohertz and up to 24 bits resolution. To control things like switches we need true or false decisions, which is basically digital electronics. George Boole. Father of Boolean algebra Boolean algebra is the easiest kind of math. George Boole, a British mathematician, 1815-1864, proposed logic and math are equivalent. All math functions can be determined using these three primary Boolean logic operators, and, or, and not. And narrows your search, or broadens your search, and not is used to exclude concepts. The and operator. Intersection. There are some common characteristics between so many fields, or we can say datasets. For example, all water bodies are not rivers, and all water bodies are not saline, but there are some water bodies that are rivers and saline. And is the intersection all sets. Another example is food products. Not all food products are exported, not all food products are dairy products, and not all food products are from Europe. The and intersection of these three sets will be those food products that are dairy, are from Europe and exported elsewhere. The or operator, either, any, sometimes, all many fields, or we can say datasets, have the characteristics or come under a common category. For example, fruits or vegetables are both edible. Similarly, fruits or vegetables or cereals are all edible. The not operator. Sometimes, there are no common characteristics between datasets, such as fruits that are not apples. Basis for digital computers. The true-false nature of Boolean logic makes it compatible with binary logic used in digital computers. Electronic circuits can produce Boolean logic operations. Circuits are called gates, not, and, or, etc. 
In electronics also you get the application of these logics on signals and those circuit diagrams implementing these logics are called gate diagrams. Have a look at the symbols of various gates and logic tables of the AND, OR, and NOT. These will be explained in detail in next slides. NOT gate. The simplest possible gate is called an inverter, or a NOT gate. It has one bit as input and produces its opposite as output. The symbol for a NOT gate and its logic table is shown. If zero or false in the input, one or true is the output, and if one or true is the input, zero or false is the output. AND gate. This is the symbol of the AND gate and its logic table. It requires two or more input bits produce one output bit. Both inputs must be true or one, for the output to be true. Otherwise, the output is false or zero. OR gate. This is the symbol of the OR gate and its logic table. It requires two or more input bits produce one output bit. At least one of the inputs must be true or one, for the output to be true. Only if both the inputs are false or zero, the output is false or zero. Combine gates. Exercise 1. Gates can be combined, that is, the output of one gate can become the input of another. Exercise 1. Try to determine the logic table for these circuits. Pause the video here to do this exercise and hit play when you are done. Exercise 1. Solution. Check you answers using the answers provided in this slide. Exercise 2. Try to determine the logic table for these circuits. Pause the video here to do this exercise and hit play when you are done. Exercise 2. Solution. Here is the solution for reference. Conclusion. Contributions of lesson. Take some time to reflect on the concepts learned in this lesson and the tasks you practiced, and how the information learned in this lesson will be beneficial for the next topic, lesson. Thank you.